little bit of time uh, to get you where you're, uh, where you're comfortable. All right, look at Job chapter number 28. It's where we're going to start here this morning. We're talking about the fear of the Lord. Are we okay, Brother Larry? You hear okay? Okay, bring the volume up just a little bit. Y'all have to help me now. If you can't hear something, you're going to have to let me know. Uh, I had them turn it down yesterday when everybody was up here working uh, because it was bouncing. But now that people are in here, it's a little bit different. And I think you might can take a little of that bass out of that or whatever that's making it sound like I'm doing this. That's not how I normally am. I'm a little more tenor. Um, uh, let's uh, Job chapter number 28. Father, we'd ask now that you might bless the uh, services today. That's better, Joseph, and that you might be with us. We appreciate so much what you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of your people to give and to come and to be here. We do not deserve so great a gift as this. And uh, couldn't be a better day for us than to have the maiden voyage on the resurrection day. Pray you'll bless this day. May you receive honor and glory from it. Help us now as we go through these things in the Scripture, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Job chapter number 28. Now we've been talking about the fear of the Lord and you're in a day and time where most people think that uh, things that are, have to do with fear are bad things. Uh, having the right kind of fear is a good thing, not a bad thing. That's like there's a big teaching that went around for a long period of time and they said that uh, conviction and guilt were a bad thing. Uh, they haven't changed it just yet. I'm waiting for the day to come where they make a choice to change that when a jury comes down or a judge comes down in a trial, that they come down with a guilty verdict or a not guilty verdict. I'm waiting for them to change the word guilty uh, because it's such a negative connotation. That has to do with euphemisms that are nowadays. They try to make something uh, nicer and sweeter by the way you say something. In other words, you describe it in a different way, more fashionable way. But they said it was bad to have guilt and bad to feel conviction. Having guilt for doing wrong is a great thing. You don't ever want your kids not to feel guilty for doing something wrong, wicked, or dirty. They should feel, they should feel an embarrassment if they see something on the box or somebody hands them some dirty literature. That kid ought to automatically, it should, make, it should prick their conscience and it should make them feel like something's not right about this and it should make them feel dirty. You say, well, I don't want them to feel that way. Well, then you're ready, going to fix them to raise a hoodlum. on them. You should feel guilty when you do wrong. One of the greatest things, the greatest ways you know that you're under conviction, and before the Lord pulls out the whip, He'll use the Word. And oftentimes what He'll do is, is He'll come to you and He'll say, now you know better than that, and He'll give you Scripture for those things. And it's better to get a whipping from the Word than it is to get a whipping from the whip. And so getting uh, feeling that way rather than trying to, to make it something that it's not. For instance, the world nowadays, as negative as it may be, it's all about positivity and trying to make things positive and trying to make things wonderful. Well, the whole world's not positive. There was a guy that wrote a, a thesis for his doctoral thesis years ago. His name slips me right now. But his whole premise for his whole abstract that he set out for his thesis was that any Christian that's worth his salt should find out the direction that the world itself is going and go directly opposite to that. Now, that's, that's actually good thinking. If you find the world that is moving toward this constant positivity, there's nothing wrong with going back and going negative. Most people that come to church, they can't tolerate straight talk. They don't tolerate preaching on sin. What they want to hear is, is I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, everything's wonderful, you're good, I'm good. Uh, people that stay cooped up in their house all the time and all they do is spend time with the television set. Maybe they go to work or they work remotely. And when they come to church, all of a sudden they want all the attention. They want somebody to look at them. What do they want them to tell them? They want them to tell them, you're okay. Everything's wonderful. You look nice. They'll hold signs out in front of them. It's wonderful to see you today. Boy, you sure do look good. What kind of a thing is that? You're looking for positive affirmation all the time. Well, when you come to church and then the preacher gets up and he preaches uh, the offense of the cross, like we'll preach a little bit about this morning, uh, it automatically offends, it upsets, it bothers people because you've been trained to believe that when you go to church or you go to school or you go to work that you're only supposed to be recognized for doing the things that are good. Well, I hate to tell you this, if you own a business, if all you do is recognize your employees for all they do that's good, you're going to probably go broke. Because sooner or later, your employees are going to make mistakes. Sooner or later, they're going to do things that they shouldn't do. Sooner or later, you have to be able to correct those things. Well, the Bible's the same way. 
And one of the reasons that we sin nowadays is, is we, it's become uh, not non-commonplace. It's not a good word for it there. It's become uh, the norm is to not be afraid of the Lord. Like the Lord's a big Santa Claus up there. He's an old man up there. He's kind of past his age. He's got a little cane, a big long beard, and he just can't wait for you to crawl up in his lap and, and for him to tell you how wonderful you are. So when you start reading the Bible and you start reading about the fear of the Lord and people are like, oh, you're not supposed to fear God. I mean, the charismatics are big on that. It's all about the love of God, 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 the love of God. Well, you got to, what's what you got? You got a perverted God. You have a president. Now, whether you know this or not, I don't know if you pay any attention at all. Back in 2009, your president made a, a, a ruling on the March the 31st of every year from thereafter would be the year that you recognize all transgender people and the alphabet soup people and all that other kind of stuff. Your sitting president right now came out on Friday afternoon, quote, Good Friday, end quote, came out on Friday and said that this 31st, which is today, will be a day whereby we recognize all of those perverts. He made it an edict. I, name of the president, as the president of the United States of America, now the other president in 2009 that just had a big meeting with him up there uh, with uh, Clinton, Obama, and, uh, and um, um, Biden up in New York City and raised a little over $25 million, you're sitting president up there. Isn't that an odd thing? Don't you find that strange that a man who's all of a sudden, uh, that, that's, a, that's a whoremonger to say the least, that his presidency is constantly under scrutiny, Clinton, and then you bring the other guy in and he's all the time talking about this transgender neutral stuff and all that kind of a thing. You bring that stuff along the way and these two guys are supporting the sitting president and the sitting president of all the days comes out on a day, resurrection day, and says we're going to, you don't think that's a direct slap in the face of God? I mean, that ought to bother you somewhat. I mean, if the day's not perverted enough to make me feel bad about saying, why don't you keep your dirty mitts off of, a, of at least one day? I mean, I, I, I'm not a politician, but I, I, don't, I don't get that. That doesn't make sense to me at all. That Bible teaches you over in 2 Samuel, he said, if you're going to be in rulership, if you're going to be in political office, you know what it says? He said that you do it in the fear of the Lord. In other words, you rule the people, but you yourself are in the fear of the Lord. Oh, God didn't have any fear of the Lord whatsoever. But you know the reason for sin? You know the reason for gossip and backbiting? You know the reason for immorality and wickedness and all that? I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about you and me. You know the reason of our sin? We don't fear the Lord anymore. It's not taught enough. The holiness of God, the purity of God, the cleanness of God. The fear of the Lord is clean. Uh, which man and whom will, I, whom will I look? Unto him that trembleth at my word. Tremble, shaking in my boots. Scared to death. You say, what is that? Listen, if God said it, God's going to do it, whether you like Him to do it or not. He's going to have His will. Back in the South, years ago, back in the South, or here in the South, we used to have a people that would get up and say, Lord, Lord make me willing to be willing. <laughs> you, you can't pray something like that. He's going to have His will whether you like it or not. Amen. That's an issue that says, I'm not willing to bow my head and bend my knee. I'm not willing to break. I'm not going to, I'm not, but if you force me to, I will. He's not here to force you. But you know why you ought to be afraid? You ought to be afraid of a God that's going to do what He says He's going to do, when He's going to do it, the way He's going to do it, and you can't stop it. That ought to scare you. And you say, well, but preacher, you know, I just choose to... Look, I know he's a, whom the Lord, perse a, a, the Lord takes up. I know that whom mother and father forsake the Lord takes up. I know that side of the Lord. I've experienced that side of the Lord. But there's too much uh, lack of the other side. Otherwise, you know what you have? You have a positive without a negative. And you don't have any power in that. There has to be repercussions for wrongdoing. And one way that you know it, and one of the ways that you raise a brat, is that you never ever correct them for doing anything wrong. You just let them decide to do what they want. Well, if a good father, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, that means if God's a good father, and he is, if he is a good father, you know what that says? That says to me that he's going to blister my behind if I choose to do wrong. That ought to bother you. But nowadays, because God's been merciful and long suffering, it doesn't tend to bother us like it used to. Is that right? I'll amen it if you don't amen it. We're off to a great start. Preacher, we're going to have visitors today. Okay, great. About time. 
Why do you think we got all these seats in here? Well, preacher, you might run them off. Okay. We're not smoking mirrors here. You know, they're going, to act, they're going to stop you in that big old foyer out there somewhere and they're going to, you know, stand out there and they're going to say, is he like that all the time or is it just a special day? No, he's like that all the time. Matter of fact, he's pretty mild today. You say, well, I, I don't, I, I've never been to a church like that. Okay, well, welcome to the right kind of church. Alright, look if you will, Proverbs chapter number 28. Come down to verse number 28. And he said unto, um, and, he, and unto man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Alright, now Job gives you a lot of things, and I already gave you this stuff the other day about the midwives, and they feared the Lord, and the Lord took care of them, and I showed you that uh, the people in Romans chapter number 3, the reason that sin reigns from Romans 3 to about oh, eight or ten there, all the way to the end of the chapter. One of the passages in there that he'll say about 15, 14 or 15 there, he'll say, because men did not fear God. That's not just unsaved people. That's become very, very commonplace, ladies and gentlemen. In the day and time in which we live, Christians no longer fear God. Think about it. If you had the proper fear of God, would you have done the things in the past month that you did, that you knew were wrong to do, but you did them anyway? The truth is, is no, you wouldn't do that. I don't care if you lie about it. Oh, well, I would have done it anyway. You'd have talked like that. You ever ask yourself if the Lord was present after you've let out that blue streak? You ever ask if the Lord was present? Do you think the Lord would sit and listen to that? Do you ever ask yourself that? Do you think the Lord was pleased with that? You ever try to pray right after you have one of those moments? Oh, I'm sorry, y- y'all don't have those moments. <laughs> you ever pray right after you have one of those thoughts? Do you feel a... There's, a, there's, there's something that's adverse there. There's something that, that seems to push against that. It's like, wait a minute, you think you're going to come out of here potty mouth and then come into my throne room and start talking to me out of the same water, bitter and sweet water coming in? Uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. Well, Lord, that's the other guy talking, and I, I apologize for him. Okay, well, let's get that other guy in line before you come up here. Take your Bible and come over in Job just a little bit further here. Look in Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. Job's oldest book in the Bible has got some good things in it for us to learn. And Job says this in verse number uh, 15. 23, 15. I'll get there in just a second. Oh, there it is. Therefore am I troubled at his presence. Make it 14. He that performeth the thing that is appointed for me, many such things are with him. Therefore am I troubled at his presence when I consider I am afraid of him. Job said, I'm afraid of God. So, well, preacher, you shouldn't be that way. Are you afraid? I'm afraid he's going to put me in hell. That's why I got saved. I'll show you a passage in a little bit here in Exodus chapter number 20 where the Lord begins to speak from up there on Mount Sinai and as he's beginning to speak up there, uh, the people say, we're afraid, we're afraid. And Moses said, fear not. The Lord hath brought you together to make you afraid. You say, preacher, I don't understand that. I was afraid of my dad. But I wasn't afraid of my dad if other people were doing things they shouldn't be doing and I wasn't doing it. And my dad showed up, I wasn't afraid at all. And Romans 13, you know what he says? He says you should be afraid of the police when they come around, the civil authorities, if you're doing something wrong. But if you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about Smokey sitting on the side of the road and pull your foot off the gas and all that if you look down there and you're not running 80. But you should be afraid that you're going to get lit up after that takes place. You say, well, why? You're doing wrong. Well, the fear of the Lord is not the fear of the Lord. It's I'm afraid that the Lord is going to chastise me. And so because I'm afraid, I'm not afraid when He shows up to do what He's going to do to everybody else. Why? Because I'm not in that group. I'm not doing it. So I don't have to worry about it. He's here for somebody. He's not here for me. That's what He's trying to explain there to him in Exodus. You don't have anything to worry about if you're not doing anything wrong. But if you're doing something wrong, you have something to be afraid of. Look in Job chapter 37. Job chapter number 37. Come all the way down to verse number 24. Y'all help me watch the time now because we got the kids coming in. They're going to still do the balloons and and that kind of thing. So you help me uh, watch. That will be a good christening for the building. Job chapter number 37. Come down to verse number 24. 
23, touching the Almighty, we cannot find Him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of, of justice. He will not afflict. Men do therefore fear Him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. You know what he said? He said, if you got any sense, you'd be afraid of the Lord. Preacher, give me something in the New Testament. Okay, come if you will please to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter number 2. This is one of the things I don't think you can overdo. I don't think you can ever be too afraid of God. I think the proper fear of God, uh, it, it certainly keep you out of, the, out of trouble and out of difficulties and problems that you may not run into if you didn't do what you chose to do. Isn't that what you teach your kids? Isn't that what you teach your kids? What do you do to keep them in line if you don't use fear to show them where the boundaries are? If you do that, this might happen to you. If you do that, this might happen to you. Or, if that doesn't happen to you, I'm going to do something to you because if they don't get you, I'm going to get you. Say, so what, what I better not, whatever you're telling them not to do. So, well, I don't do that. I just let my kids, you know, be barefoot and run around, do whatever they want to do, and run through a pit of rattlesnakes or a sand spurs or whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, they'll learn. God will teach them. Somebody will teach them. I, I feel for you parents. I know a little bit about that, but I feel for you parents. It doesn't get any better with grandkids and great-grandkids except that you can tell them, come pick them up. <laughs> but, but beyond that, the, the, the problem is still the same. It's trying to correct the uncorrectable. It's the same thing. It's just a different period of time. It's no different. You say, well, you know, they're facing different things. But it's the same principle. I'll grant you there's more temptations and there's more liberality today. I'll grant you that. But the principle is still the same. You still have to be willing to step in. It's hard to say no, isn't it? You say, why? It takes effort on your part. It's easier to just roll with it. All right, look in Philippians chapter number 2, talking about this thing about the fear of the Lord. And here's the Apostle Paul, our Apostle. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, we're in 2.12, but how much more in my absence? Work out your own salvation with... Well, you've got to be kidding me. You say, why? I'm trying to work that thing out that's on the inside. I'm already saved. And he said, number one, fear. Number two, trembling. Knees knocking together. Why? The Lord gave me the responsibility of taking the thing that's on the inside, the embryo, and work it to the outside against my flesh. And he says, you do that with fear and trembling. Let me give you a couple of things on trembling. Come to Isaiah chapter 66. You realize over there in, in uh, Psalms, he tells you in uh, 114 or so there, you know what he said? That the devils believe and tremble? Well, do you believe and tremble? I mean, really tremble. Isaiah chapter 66. Look in verse number 2. <clears throat> For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things hath been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look. That's what we want. We want fellowship. We want to get his attention. Is that right? To this man will I look, even to him that is of a poor and a contrite spirit. Doesn't mean you're broke financially. It means that when it comes to that, that your spirit compared to his is emaciated. It is poor. It is without uh, its own will, its own desires. It's the spirit that's been through Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, when the Lord goes, before He goes to Calvary, He goes up there after they've had supper. You'll hear a little bit about it this morning. And they go up and they sing a hymn. They cross Kidron uh, River there, or Creek there. They get across to the other side. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, that's the place where the two wills cross. The thing that happens is that cross takes place because of the obedience of subjection of itself to the poor contrite spirit. Lord, is there any way that this spirit can pass? I mean, that this cup can pass for me? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Set his face like a fan for the joy set before him, endured the cross. You won't able to do the cross until you come to the point where you recognize poor and contrite, me, contrite, broken, contrition, stirred up, more than just repentance. It hurts you, it bothers you to have sinned. I mean, it tears you out of the frame. David says in Psalm 51 that when you get the Lord's attention, he said the gifts of the Lord are the thing the Lord is pleased with in Psalm 51 is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. 
I mean, when's the last time when you sinned that it put you under contrition? Look the word up in a dictionary. You can look at across the board, even the modern uh, definition of contrition. It's to be overwhelmed by the fact that you've done something so bad, it literally just dries you up and makes you shake because it's so bad what you did. Does it bother you to sin against God that way? A holy God that saved you and that, that sin is one of the sins that nailed Him to the cross? Does it bother you that way? I mean, if it bothered you that way, would you continue to do what you're doing? The truth is no. There's very little contrition nowadays. There's repentance, I'll grant you that. It's a quick trip to the altar and throw a little 1 John 1.9 on it and thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ, cleanses from all sin. We'll hear about that today. Praise the Lord for full salvation. I'm grateful for that. But after I'm saved, shouldn't I know better? After I'm saved, don't I have in me a sixth sense? Don't I have inside me a power? If I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me, you know what He tells me? I can stop sin if I want to. I don't believe, like a lot of people do, that you just oopsie trip and fall into sin. I believe if you're in fellowship with the Lord, He tells you before you do it. I believe that the Lord tells you through His Holy Spirit, Hey boy, you better watch it. You better watch it. Hey young lady, you better watch it. You're going to have to mess up. And when you mess up, it's because you made a choice to mess up over His voice. Don't do it. Don't do it. When you do it, does it bother you? To the point of contrition? Boy, I really messed up. I know, I realize some people get a little carried away with it. I realize some people uh, carry it too far. But I think most people don't carry it far enough. I think most of us when we sin, we're just like, well, I know I messed up. You know, I'm just a sinner, saved by grace. That's just the way it is. Yeah, but we're kind of slap happy, kind of lopsided about that, a little too, too relaxed. Would you agree? Notice what he says here. He said, to this man I'll look, even to him that is poor of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. Come to Psalms 119. Peter tells you over in 1 Peter, uh, he tells you that you're to sojourn in fear. Psalms 119. Years ago we went through all of the Psalms there in Psalms 119 and went through all of that stuff. 120 19, 119, 119, 119, Thou puttest away all the wicked of the earth like dross, therefore I love thy testimonies. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. Well, I thank the Lord that when I go over to 1 John, come to 1 John real quick and let me show you this, because I'm sure some of you are already thinking about this verse. 1 John chapter 4, this is a favorite verse of the Charismatics. You say you shouldn't pick on the charismatics. What do you want me to call them? Whack-a-moles? People that don't love the truth? I mean, I'm trying to use a euphemism to make you feel more comfortable that I'm just labeling them. I'm wore out nowadays. You can't label anything anymore. It's like, you know, we don't, don't put a label on something. I'm glad I got label on stuff in my refrigerator. You say, why? I, I, I eat a jalapeno? I mean, it lights me up. She loves them. She can eat them till she breaks out in a sweat. I, I don't want to taste one of them and go, well, that's a jalapeno. I keep picking up the same jar. Well, I thought it was bread and butter pickles. I like those. They're sweet. Got a little bite to them, right? I like those. They don't taste anything like a jalapeno. I'm glad there's labels on jars in my cabinet and stuff like that. You folks have been real kind. You've been sending food over. What we do, when we get it there, we put a sticky note on it and we put on that thing what it is. You say, why? Some of the stuff can be frozen. Some of the stuff can be heated. Some of the stuff can't be heated. You put the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time, you ruin a good meal. It has a label on it. I think it's right to label, but nowadays don't label anything. Nowadays, it's kind of like, do you know who you are? Do you know what you are? Well, I'm not really sure of myself. Okay, we have a label for that. Insanity. You need to go to the nut house. That's ridiculous. I don't, I don't really know who I am. You're right. You're too stupid to know anything because you just got born and you don't have enough sense to know what you are. So we call you because of your plumbing boy and we call you because of your plumbing girl. We call you male. We call you female. And never the twain come together until marriage. 
But when you break all those barriers down and you have no labels, you have what you have now, and now all of a sudden it's same sex and this and that and the other and all that. No. No. You are outside the norm. Well, you, you can't label that. No, you can't label that. The Bible labels that. It labels it as an abomination. They're trying to eliminate the Bible. They're teaching your kids in school. Don't say that. Uh, refer to them as a they. Refer to who is a they? All those people in the corner? That's they. No, we're referring to that person. What's he got more than one demon in him? That's a they. They's a bunch of them in him. That some of y'all, you got. It's not time to pray yet. This carpet's about the same as over there. You're like, why has he got to do all that kind of stuff? I just feel moved. You can't get yourself ready for this stuff. I don't even know what I'm going to say. But I get up here. And, I'm, I'm looking at some of you, and it's it's making you nervous. You're starting to sweat. You're 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 flopping around like a, a chicken. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing wrong with still being right. There's nothing wrong with teaching your kids the right way to do things. You're weird if you don't do that stuff. You got to understand, ladies. He gets a little excited. <laughs> He's got kids on the ground, and eventually he'll have grandkids. And the reason some of y'all don't care is because your kids are already grown. Doesn't affect you anymore. You just learned to go with the tide, haven't you? It's strange to me how you can't label that. Have you ever been labeled a Christian? Good. I like being labeled a Christian. I'm kind of like, thank you. I mean, the ones that have labeled me as a Christian, they meant it as slang. I'm kind of like, thank you, I'll take that. Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, you're one of those. Appreciate it. Amen. I don't mind being labeled for the right things. But nowadays it's strange. You're not supposed to label anybody. One of the things that happens here in 1 John chapter number 4, and it has to do with the brethren that do love the Lord. I believe they love the Lord. They think they love the Lord. But when it comes to this matter here, uh, what they wind up doing is, is saying that you're not supposed to fear God anymore. Cast out fear. If you have any fear, fear is of the devil. The Lord didn't give you the spirit of fear, but a love and a sound mind and so on and so forth. The spirit of fear, ladies and gentlemen, that he's talking about there is not ever the spirit of fearing the Lord. It's a spirit of fearing the Lord so you don't fear the things that you shouldn't be afraid of. You don't have to worry if you have the right spirit and the right spirit of fear toward God. You don't have to worry about what everybody else is worried about. Or oh, what's going to happen on April the... What's the day that the, the, the moon goes dark or whatever it is? April 8th. They're having an eclipse thing. You know, and it's crossing all these places and you know, and it's a sign from God and all that kind of stuff. Jews require a sign. I don't know if it's going to mean anything or not. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to mobilize all the people? I don't know. I'm not worried about it. Well, you better stock up some food and you better worry about this and what happens if so on and so forth. I read an article yesterday when I was studying. You know what it says? Reasons why you should fear the 2024 hurricane season. And it goes in there to give you a whole list of El Nino and El Nino. And one of them creates an environment where more hurricanes get stirred up and the water's already warmer than it's already been and it could actually go ahead and start stirring them up early. It's kind of like, what's the matter? The economy gone south again? I need to go buy some plywood or something and get a generator and, and get worried. And, and, the, and the hurricane's on. Hey! It's April! Don't get me worried until get out in July and August, Okay? You need to be worried about it now. Why? Are you running short on a news cycle? Like there's not enough to talk about? My aching back. Reasons you should be worried. That's the spirit of fear. You say, what are you worried about? I'm not worried about a hurricane season. Well, preacher, don't you worry? Uh, to the point of being sinful at times. I worry about making right decisions. I worry about finishing right. I worry about quitting. I worry about getting depressed and downtrodden when God said for me not to. I worry about breaking fellowship with the Lord. I worry about this human being, this flesh, being displeasing to God. Yeah, I worry to the point of those kinds of things. Do you? I worry about that stuff. I worry about God taking His hand off of me. And there's nothing I can do about it. There ain't anything I can do to earn it. And there's nothing if all of a sudden He said, I'm done with you. That scares me to death. 
I'm going to do my best to you know, say, well, oh, you're just brown-nosing God. Call it whatever you want to call it. I'm going to stay as close to Him as I can. And if He says jump, I'm going to do my best to say how high. I can't jump quite as high as I used to jump. I'm getting a little older now, but I'm sure going to give it a try. Man, you didn't even get six inches off the ground. Yeah, but it wasn't for lack of trying. White men can't jump. <laughs> I guarantee you. I guarantee you this. I guarantee you, if you're afraid enough of God, you'll jump. I guarantee you that just simply means when He says it, I do it. One percent hesitation, hundred percent rebellion. When God says it, I do it. You say why? Because God said I'm afraid of Him. Keep me from getting in trouble. I'm afraid He's going to be displeased with me. I don't know. Maybe I feel like I got more to lose than you do. That scares me to death. I know that if I'm left to myself, I know what I'm capable of. I guess you don't. I guess you must think you can make it without Jesus. <laughs> You're going to love the sermon this morning. You say, why? It's going to fit right down an old Pharisee, an old uh, self-righteous person's right down your pathway. You're going to just love the fact that any time a preacher preaches to you anything that has to do with works, you're going to eat it up and love it like pigs love slop. Because you think you can make it on your own. If there's lost people that show up here today, boy, they're going to have a rough time to make it. You say, why? I can tell you why they're lost, and I can tell you why you're backslid. You don't fear God. You're not afraid of God. You figure you're doing okay because you're doing better than most. Okay, but when you get up in front of Him and recognize the terror of the Lord, that's going to cure you from sucking eggs. John chapter number, 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 17. Here in His love, made perfect, that we have boldness in the day of judgment, because He is, uh, so as He is, so are we in this world. Did you get that? You say, here in His love, what are we going to talk about? The context is what? Look at it. It's the day of judgment, verse 17. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that uh, feareth is not made perfect in love. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Cast out fear. It's the devil. Anytime you fear, uh, it's the devil. It's the devil. No, it's not. The context of that is in the day of judgment. I'm not afraid of my losing my salvation. We had a fellow that asked about an individual getting into a discussion, an argument about uh, people that believe and don't believe in eternal security and those kind of things. Let me just tell you this. I can tell you why people don't believe in eternal security and it's not doctrinal. I can tell you why they don't believe in eternal security. Because they're self-righteous individuals that believe they're righteous enough to make it on their own. There ain't a humble bone in their body. There is not a humble bone in their body. They refuse to accept salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. They're not able to receive charity. They have that arrogance about them. They always, you know what's interesting when you talk to those people? They believe you can lose it, but they never lose it. Well, how about if I show you, if you go contradictory to Scripture, that you're sinning? You considered that one? Not just that you don't smoke and drink and cuss and chew and go with them that do. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how about your thought life? How about the passage in the Bible where he says that if you've committed, if you've broken one, you're guilty of the whole thing. Is the Apostle Paul saved or not saved in, uh, over there in, in uh, Romans chapter number 7? Saved as I am and you are. That's 27 years after the road to Damascus. You know what he's talking about? The flesh and the spirit. You don't write to divide your Bible, you'll be lost every day of your life, if you're honest. One of the greatest things you should have if you're a saved individual is, is eternal security resting in the bosom of Jesus and knowing that no matter what condition my flesh is in, my soul is going to heaven. Because I got saved. I'm sealed to the day of redemption. But if you don't rightly divide your Bible, you still got that flesh and spirit connected together and you're a self-righteous imbecile is what you are. You're an individual. I'm labeling you. You're not a Bible believer at all. You're, oh, I just believe the Bible. No, you're not. You're trying to put people in bondage to a form of righteousness. You can't make it by your own righteousness. Not by works of righteousness. You ain't going to make it. All our righteousness is as what? Okay, then you've got to believe the Bible. If the Bible says that, then that's what He says about me. Say, so what does that mean? After I get saved, anything I do is powered by the motorized the Holy Spirit inside me. And if I'm able to get my flesh under control and keep Him under control, let's say for the next, uh, oh, say, two hours after that, guess what? I better be careful to keep a bit and a bridle on Him. You say, why? He's always trying to talk me out of them handcuffs. 
Every, every time you turn around, if you could just loosen the cuffs just a little, they're, just, they're hurting. Just take them off a little bit, just using an old analogy. If you could just loosen them just a tad, you know, all that kind of stuff, so I can dislocate my thumb and get my hand out and get my other hand free and then beat you in the head with it and that kind of a thing. And uh, it, it hurts. And I, I'm going to complain on you because it's, it's, if you could just loosen them a little bit, I, I'm not saying all that. That's my flesh talking to me. Everybody deserves a break. I mean, you shouldn't be so hard on me all the time. I mean, you're not hard on me. I'm hard on me. I mean, my flesh is hard against itself. It's not fair. It's just not right. You deserve this and you deserve that. You see, yours may not be that way. And my spirit inside is saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Put him to bed. Put him to bed. I put him to bed. You know what he says? I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Shut up, go to sleep. I gotta go to the bathroom. Shut up and go to sleep. Did you get the stuff and put the cat out? You know, uh, wind the cat and put the clock out and that kind of thing. Did you did you get that uh, stuff done? Did you take out the garbage? You said, shut up and go to sleep. And the next thing you know, you're laying there looking at the ceiling, and the spirit's going, "Hey, what's the problem? It's me." Paul says, the things I would do, that I do not. If you don't rightly divide that, you know what you'll think? You'll think Paul's writing out about an unsaved person. You can't be an unsaved person in that passage because you don't have the Spirit in that passage. In the passage, you have the opportunity to listen to the other man, the, the good man as opposed to the wretched man. How could that be a saved, an unsaved man? If you're unsaved, you're dead in trespasses and sin. You're rotten inside and out. And after you get saved, the core's good. You're still rotten on the outside. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that a blessing to come for Easter Sunday morning and come in for such great, great messages and those kind of things and you get told, you're rotten. <laughs> That's why when you die, you leave your bag behind. You just leave it in a box or put it in the ground or we you know, put it to ashes or whatever it may be. No disrespect intended, but you never ever wonder why you don't take your body? You say, well, how can your body inherit something pure and perfect and holy? But he says, Paul said, for me to depart from Christ is far better. Paul said, I know that when I depart, what does he say? Absent from the body is instantaneously. Well, Paul, you left your body behind. What a mess, Paul. You even left it without a head on it. How are you going to get into heaven without that? Wait till you see Moses and Elijah in the tribulation. I'm not going to be here for it, those of you that haven't got saved yet. You're going to work your way to heaven, you get a chance in the tribulation, okay? Notice 1 John chapter 4, there is no fear in love. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's not true. When he's talking about that, come to Exodus chapter number 9. Exodus chapter number 9. Got to hurry, got about five minutes here. Is this making sense to you? Yes, sir. See, what do I think? I think a good healthy fear of God will prevent a lot of things from happening in your life. Ma'am, I'm going to help you here. <laughs> you ever read 1 Peter chapter number 3? you got a hard-headed husband, and some of us do. I'm sure you do. I've got to be careful how I say that. I'm married to a woman. But you are, you're married to a hard-headed husband. You know what that Bible says? That Bible teaches you that, that you know, the man is not one with a conversation light, but a meek and quiet spirit. But you ever notice what else comes with that? Coupled with what? Sure got quiet right there. He tells the woman not just to keep your mouth shut. He said, you do it because you're coupled with fear. Fear of what? That your husband's going to beat you? What is the fear in 1 Peter 3? It's fear in the Lord. Preacher, if you just knew the ogre I was married to, there's no provision for that in the passage. If you have a man that's not obeying what God said, by the way, unlike many people try to do and make that lost people, that's saved people. That means I can be saved and still have a husband that's not in fellowship with God, and I can be saved and be a woman and not be in fellowship with God and still be saved. 
But you know what he says? Coupled with fear. He uses the same thing when it comes to your disobedience to civil authority and paying taxes. That the Word of God be not blasphemed. That's a pretty serious accusation to make. Well, if you're not afraid of God, you don't care. You know what you do? You run around and tell people don't pay their taxes. You're a sovereign citizen. I know where that comes from. You have a problem with authority. You have no fear. You have a problem across the board with authority. It's always any, anybody, whoever the authority is, unless they're an authority how you like it to be. You lost your fear. God put that person there. Whether you like it or not, you ever pause to think about that? You think Daniel picked the authority over him? How about Joseph? That's a good one. You think Joseph picked the authority over him? You get to pick and choose who you get under? You know what your job is? Shut up and do what you're told to do. But you can't find people do that anymore. You're too opinionated about that stuff. You have a problem with authority. Because you don't have fear. You say you believe the Bible. If you believe the Bible, then would you be doing what you're doing? Or would you do what God says to do? I don't know. You answer it yourself. Are you in Exodus chapter number 9? Uh, look if you pull verse number 19. Exodus chapter number 9. Come down to verse number 19. What page is that on? There it is. 19, send, send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and uh, upon thou the ha that hast in the field. For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home, the hail, hail shall come upon them, and they shall die. Now, he's given instruction. He's given a warning before what's coming. He didn't surprise them with it. He said, listen, go get your cows out of the field, and if there's any person that's out in the field, head for the high country, and get in the house. Is that fair? Is that a good, good interpretation of what's there? Now watch how practical the Bible is. He that feareth the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle to flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. What do you reckon happened to them? <laughs> they got killed. Why? Because they didn't do what God told them to do. Look in Exodus chapter number 20. I know a lot of times we blame stuff on the devil and things like that, and I'm sure he deserves all the credit and recognition he gets. But oftentimes I see him in my mind's eye. I, I see him over in the corner weeping and crying and bawling and squalling, and you ask him what's wrong. He said, I'm constantly being accused of things I'm not guilty of. I think sometimes we give the devil a little too much credit. I think that a lot of times the trouble that comes our way is because God warned us and God warned us and God warned us and God warned us and God, warned us and, God and we're like the Egyptians in this earth. The Lord even gave uh, liberty and gave grace to the individual if they heard they weren't even Israelites. Even the servants that were there, if they did what God said to do, you know what He did? He gave had mercy on them. Exodus chapter number 20. I'll give you this real quick and then we'll close out because the kids are going to come in. So before you break and go to the bathrooms and stuff, look at uh, verse number 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise and the trumpet of the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. Don't be afraid, but be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of what God's saying and the tone in which he's saying it, as long as you understand he's doing it to protect you. So he's helping you. Don't be afraid of what he's saying, because if you do what he says, you don't have anything to be afraid of. Now, if you learn that, ladies and gentlemen, if you learn that even the day and time in which we live, come real quick to Psalms chapter 33. Psalm chapter 33. If you learn to do that, then you know what you'll wind up doing? You'll wind up living a whole lot better life. And it won't bother you. How many people have you heard on a regular basis talk about the tone of somebody's voice? They used to uh, not like the way that the old preacher talked. 
They didn't like the tone of his voice. But a lot of that got thrown off because they didn't like what he was saying. But they hit it by, well, I don't like how he says it. Okay, well, that's kind of a funny way to sort of clean it up a little bit to say, I really don't like what he said, but I'm going to make it a personal attack. That's why when you deal with individuals and immediately they default to other people's past or they default to their uh, things they've done wrong and that kind of thing and they begin to magnify their character traits, you know they don't have much of an argument. What they're trying to do is, is ruin their testimony because their testimony is true, but then no matter what, they're trying to tell you the testimony must not be good. Why well, look at what they did and look at what they used to do. That's why when people tell you, I remember you back in 1974 and what you did and this and that and the other. Sorry, I was a bad testimony. It's not who I am now. It's who I who used to be. I apologize for that and move on. But when they do that, you know what they're doing? They're trying to negate the truth that you're telling them. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody does. But when somebody is constantly attacking, you know what? You're making some ground. All right, Psalms chapter 33. And we'll, we'll stop on this one. Uh, look, if you will, please. Let me get my reference here. Look in verse number 8. 33, yeah, that's it, verse number 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in what? Now, when you have, think about that at the second uh, coming of Jesus Christ, and you've got the Lord coming down with the breath coming out of His mouth there, uh, the one that spoke star clusters into uh, existence and those kind of things, do you ever pause and think about it for just a minute? The entire earth is going to be afraid of Him. Why shouldn't we be afraid of Him now? Now, these children are going to come in here and we're going to do a wordless book. and. Y'all...